So you have a 21-year-old female who presents to the local ED hypotensive with respiratory depression and an altered LOC. Her family reports that she has ingested approximately, and this is best guessed, 40 verapamil tablets, so almost 5 grams. Now keep in mind a typical dosing regimen of verapamil is anywhere from 120 to 360 milligrams once per day, depending on what you're taking it for. Best guess is that she ingested these tablets around 11.30 last night, and it is now 8.30 in the morning. The monitor shows a bradycardic hypotensive patient with what is interpreted as a first degree AV block. Additionally, the few laboratory results that are immediately collected show some obvious electrolyte derangement and a profound metabolic acidosis. So obviously the primary questions that we will be answering in the next several minutes is why is this happening and what are we going to do about it? In order to understand our specific management plan, we need to know what verapamil does. Verapamil, or its trade name in this case, Calin, is a calcium channel blocker. It's very lipophilic and primarily targets cardiac muscle and the cardiac conduction system. Its mechanism of action is similar to all of the rest of the calcium channel blockers in that it targets the action of calcium and more specifically its effect on muscle fibers. Calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the web-like structure surrounding the myofibrils which contain the muscle fibers. When calcium is released, it is allowed to act on its target by passing through voltage-gated channels, in this case they are called L-channels. Calcium then provides a bond between the thick myosin and thin actin fibers allowing for muscle fiber contraction. Calcium channel blockers, like verapamil, close the voltage-gated L-channels, preventing calcium from acting on the myosin and actin myofilaments. This action takes place in smooth vascular muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. Because of its cardioselective nature, verapamil is likely to depress SA and AV node function, as well as reduce cardiac contractility. Its effect on the vascular smooth muscle results in a drop in blood pressure. So while verapamil is designed to mitigate the effects of hypotension and rate issues in cardiac arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation, the effects of toxicity can be overwhelming and include obvious hypotension, bradycardia, and acidosis from hypoperfusion, potentially hyperglycemia as these agents impair the release of insulin and increase insulin resistance resulting in hyperglycemia, which is a hallmark of severe calcium channel blocker intoxication, as well as signs of congestive heart failure from negative inotropic effects on the heart muscle. So now that we know the whys, let's look at the what to do's. In this discussion, I am basing management off of our survival flight toxicology protocol. It is evidence-based, updated yearly, and vetted through intensivists and emergency physicians at the University of Michigan. So why not? The first place we will start is the first page. Initial management is primarily supportive and hinges on airway and hemodynamic support. We will manage a compromised airway, support ventilation, and provide appropriate hemodynamic support based upon the patient's current shock state utilizing fluids, inotropes, and pressors. A quick rush exam using point-of-care ultrasound can help us identify the shock state. This can be pivotal, especially when the time since ingestion has been lengthy. Gastric decontamination is typically most effective when the time between ingestion and intervention is minimal. If activated charcoal is in your management plan, I would recommend intubating the patient first, especially if they've been vomiting, has an altered LLC, or is experiencing respiratory depression. While there is no actual antidote for calcium channel blocker toxicity, IV calcium is logically indicated to overcome intracellular hypocalcemia. When it comes to specific considerations for calcium channel blocker overdose, you will find it is often concurrent with management for beta blocker overdose as profound hypotension and bradycardia are two common and deadly clinical manifestations. Therefore, management focuses on increasing heart rate and blood pressure with IV crystalloid, atropine, and high doses of vasopressors. While glucagon is primarily indicated for beta blocker overdose, 
Oftentimes, individuals overdose on multiple agents, so administering glucagon in the case of a calcium channel blocker overdose cannot hurt. Just remember that the amount of glucagon needed to be effective is quite substantial. If the patient is experiencing refractory hypotension, additional therapy will be needed. This may include high-dose insulin with euglycemia and a 20% intralipid emulsion. Both calcium channel blockers and beta blockers disrupt the secretion of insulin by the beta cells in the pancreas. The thought behind the use of this therapy includes positive inotropic effect with vasodilation and improved coronary circulation, facilitated uptake of carbohydrates by myocardial muscle, resulting in a ready source of energy to those cells. This therapy supports the body while the drug is naturally eliminated and has no direct effect in neutralizing it. On the other hand, a lipid emulsion is thought to sequester lipophilic drugs like verapamil and thus decrease its bioavailability. It is believed that a lipid emulsion creates what is known as a lipid sink that attracts the lipophilic substance from the plasma and away from targets in smooth vascular and cardiac muscle. The other management piece that needs to be considered is the agents as well as the management interventions effect on electrolytes, particularly potassium. Think about how we are managing this overdose compared to common management strategies for hyperkalemia and deduce what your serum potassium will do if left unattended. Thanks for watching.